If you watch my other channel, you might know that I've been working on these guitar sustainer circuits. And what this is, is a device that if you put it near a metal guitar string or any ferromagnetic string, it'll make that string vibrate without touching it. And it'll continue vibrating indefinitely. And this one I've got here is, I guess, kind of the summary of everything that I've learned since I've been working on this. And I've released this as an open hardware project so you can make your own. And I'm also selling this as a kit on my website, metalmarshmallow.com, in case that's easier. And I didn't invent this concept, but what's unique about this one in particular is first that it's easy to embed in projects, second is that this one is computer controllable, and finally this one is really easy to modify and build upon since it's open hardware. And so today I want to show you how to use this, how to assemble it if you bought the kit, or how to get started with the open hardware project in case you just want to build your own from scratch. So to start with, the board can be powered by a 9 volt battery, which it doesn't have to be, and I'll show you that in a moment. But if you do plan on using a 9 volt, you'll need to solder these battery terminals onto the board. And you should try not to think too hard about which one is positive and which one is negative. Just notice that one is larger and the other one is smaller, and the silk screen on the board depicts that. And if you have a dead 9 volt, you might snap it into the battery terminals and kind of use it to hold them in place as you're soldering it. But if you do that, just be careful and try to work quickly because soldering a battery can be a little bit dangerous. And so this is how these go. I hope that's clear. And when the sustainer is playing a string, it draws around 70 milliamps. So judging by this, it should be able to do that continuously for at least six hours on a single battery, I would think. And if it's on but not playing a string, it only draws six or eight milliamps. So next you're going to need to solder the inductors to the board, but there are a few things you need to know before you get started. First is that they're somewhat fragile since the pins are press fit into the plastic, and if they get pushed out, the wire that's soldered onto them is going to break, and this is probably not repairable, so be careful with the pins. And second is that these contain magnets, and you might just want to take a moment to double check that they're in the same orientation in both inductors, which means that the inductors should repel one another if you hold them face to face like this. Okay, next you should notice that the inductors are not the same as one another, and on the board you can see that they're labeled input coil and output coil, and you can tell which is which if you measure the resistance with the multimeter, the input coil is about 2,000 ohms, and the output coil is only like 14 or 15 ohms. Okay, you know what? I'm going to label them. How about that? Yours will have labels on them so you can tell which one is which, okay? And then finally, you need to know that the polarity is important. So notice that each inductor has one square tab and one rounded tab, and the silk screen on the board also depicts a square tab and a kind of rounded-ish tab it's marked with a plus, and so the rounded tab on the inductor should match up with the plus, like so. And for some reason, nobody believes me that these inductors have polarity. And so just to be clear, you can put them both in the right way, or you could put them both in the wrong way and you'll be fine. But if one is the right way and one is the wrong way, then your circuit isn't going to work, and you'll be the victim of your own hubris. <laughs> Okay, so now this is ready to be used, and there is this switch here on the board, and if the switch is in the middle position, then the sustainer is off, but then if you switch it over here, reg means regular mode, which just means that the circuit is on and working normally. Then if you switch it to the other side, OVT means overtone mode, and this means that the sustainer is on, and it's more likely to make the string vibrate at a higher pitch than its fundamental, usually an octave or twelfth above, although how well this works depends on a lot of different things. <laughs>
And by the way, by default, I would hold the sustainer this way with the input coil closer to the fixed end of the string, although it's interesting to experiment holding it both ways. Okay, the next question that some of you might have is, well, do I really need to use the inductors that came in the kit, or can I use something else? In particular, can I just use guitar pickups, which are also inductors, and they're functionally similar to these? And the answer to that is that I haven't played around with it that much, but I did get it working, although it's somewhat fiddly to get working. So here I'm using just a regular guitar pickup in place of the input coil, and I have that going into the sustainer board here, and if you buy one, yours will be green. This one's purple, but it's the same board. And then for the output coil, I'm using a guitar pickup where I removed all of the original windings and replaced them with 8 ohms of 28 gauge wire and this works really well on the low strings also works really well on the kind of medium strings. But this is kind of the most fiddly and difficult to get working on the higher strings. <laughs> and I actually never got this working on the high E string. Although it's also somewhat difficult to get the thinner strings going in any case. And I'm also using light gauge strings, so heavier strings might work better. And it might have been better to use 4 ohms of 26 gauge wire on the output coil. That would have made this coil stronger. Anyway, you can also use the guitar pickups to sustain chords, although usually some strings are sustained more strongly than others. <laughs> Okay, now I want to show you how this can be controlled with an Arduino or Raspberry Pi or some other kind of microcontroller. And that is what these pins are for that came in the kit. And this needs to be soldered into these holes here. But Mike, this is in the way of the battery. Well, that's by design because now you're going to power the board through these two pins here, and you really shouldn't be doing that when there's a battery plugged in. So you can have one or the other, but not both. So these two pins, which are labeled 5 to 16 volts and ground, I'm going to plug into this breadboard, and this just connects them directly through to this 9 volt wall adapter. And then the other two pins, I'm going to connect to digital output pins on this teensy microcontroller. So on the sustainer, one of these pins is labeled enable. And when this is low or open, the sustainer will be off. And then you have to pull it high to enable the sustainer or to turn it on. And once you do that, whether the sustainer is in regular or overtone mode depends on the state of the other pin, which is labeled regular. So if that one is low or open, it'll be in overtone mode. And if it's high, the sustainer will be in regular mode. So 
because the label tells you what happens when you pull the pin high. And by the way, the actual switch should be off in order for this to work properly. Then, this is a little bit silly, but for the sake of demonstration, I have these buttons connected to input pins on the Teensy. So pressing this one will pull the enable pin high, and pressing this one will pull the regular mode pin high. And pressing this one by itself doesn't really have any effect, since either way the sustainer is not enabled, it's off. Whereas pressing this one by itself turns the sustainer on in overtone mode. And then pressing both buttons together turns it on in regular mode. And this will work with either 3 or 5 volt logic, and the two control pins don't draw any current. So finally, I'd like to show you the open hardware project, and this is on Bitbucket, and I'll leave a link down below. And so the main things here are the board and the inductors, and the board was originally designed in KiCad, which is free software, but I've also included PDF drawings of everything in case that's easier. So here's the schematic, and I've described its operation in detail in a previous video on my other channel, and the only real difference here is that I've added some MOSFETs so that it can be computer controllable. And it's also interesting to note that the chip I'm using has two op amps on it, but the second one here isn't being used for anything. So if you plan on modifying this, it might be interesting to think about what you could do with this second op amp. And I've also included PDFs that show the board layout, but I guess if you just wanted to order some boards, but didn't want to order them from me, you can just upload the KiCad board file to Oshpark like so. And that's kind of surprisingly expensive, and what you'll get if you do this is just a board that doesn't have any components on it. So also in this repository there's a list of all of the components that you need, both for the board and for the inductors, and there are part numbers and suppliers and all of that, and then there's also a PDF that shows you where on the board all of the parts go. So you could use this to assemble your own board. Okay, so then there are the inductors. And of course you're going to need a bobbin, and all of the design files for the bobbin are here, including an STL file, which you can just directly 3D print. And if you don't have a 3D printer, these are actually really close in size to just regular sewing machine bobbins. And I did build some prototypes with these, and they actually work quite well. Although God help you in winding them. I really don't know how you would do this without a machine. And the only issue with sewing machine bobbins is that the holes are a little too small, so you have to ream them out to a quarter inch so the magnet fits. And then once you have your bobbin, there's this document here that shows how to assemble the inductors, what gauge wire to use on them, how many turns, what direction to wind them in, where the magnet goes, and all of that kind of stuff. So this should be everything you need to know to make your own inductors. So one thing that this project does not have is any kind of housing or structure that would allow you to rest the board on the guitar strings that are adjacent to the ones that you're playing. But if somebody wants to design some 3D printed thing that kind of clips onto the board and does that, I would be happy to include that in the repository. But also, resting the board on the adjacent strings isn't really necessary, as you will see in my next video. So yeah, stay tuned for that. That's going to be a right corker, that one. And the other thing I wanted to say is that this open hardware thing, I guess, is a little bit of an experiment for me since selling things on my website is how I fund these projects to begin with, and it's how I fill my belly with tacos and spicy noodles. So if you want to support this work, please do buy something from me, and hopefully by releasing everything for free I'm not making myself the victim of my own hubris. But yeah, anyway, I guess that was all I had to say about that for now, so... As usual, thank you so much for watching. 
please subscribe and like and leave comments and share on social media and all that kind of crap. And I guess I'll see you next time. Bye.